Casebook of Gregory Hood. Tonight, the story of The Red Capsule. Another exciting adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood. Well, it's Monday night in San Francisco, and we have a weekly date with Gregory Hood and his attorney and great friend, Sanderson Taylor. Tonight's rendezvous is at that happy bourne from which no fish returned. Bernstein's Grotto on Powell Street. Let's join them there, shall we? Hello, Gregory. Evening, Mr. Taylor. Ah, there you are, Harry Bartell. Evening, Harry. I hope you don't mind we jumped the gun on you a little. I could never resist these cuckoo clams on the half shell. As you see, he's on to his second dozen. You'll have some, won't you, Harry? They're very special. Thanks, Greg. I will. By the way, if you can take fish two nights running, you're invited up to my apartment tomorrow evening. Oh, swell, Greg. What's the occasion? A friend of mine just sent me a batch of brook trout from the Sierra. Mm, sounds wonderful. But you don't know how wonderful. I swear you've never tasted trout until you've had Greg cook them. Well, they won't be at their best tomorrow, I'm afraid. Brook trout is one dish that's better cooked under rather rustic conditions. For my money, the only proper way to cook them is in sizzling hot bacon grease in a skillet over an open campfire under the pine tree. And that, Harry, by one of those happy coincidences, cues us directly into tonight's adventure. Our story from the casebook began just that way on a certain star-clustered evening last fall. It sounds like a potent setting for adventure. Well, we found plenty of that, as usual. We'd flown out of San Francisco in my beach craft, complete with rods and flies and a week's camping equipment. We landed in the private field of a friend of mine in Yosemite County and hiked from there on up into the mountains. The gods were very kind to us. At first, we hit a heavenly stream teeming with hungry, vigorous fish. At the end of an exciting day's sport, we knelt by our campfire preparing the meat. These potatoes in the ashes are almost done, Greg. Yes, I'd better fan up the flames for the skillet. Did you slice the bacon? Yes, yes, and clean the trout. Ah, this is the life, Sandy. We're going to have a meal we couldn't equal in San Francisco's finest restaurant. First, the bacon. Ah, there we are. Did you hear that, Greg? I swear I heard someone calling. It's probably little Sir Echo out for his evening rehearsal for the Bohemian Grove. I did hear someone, Greg. Here in the forest primeval, where we've come to escape from dazzling wenches and murderers and all those fascinating encumbrances. What? There is someone, Greg. Yes. Yeah. Who's there? Friends to this ground and lean unto the day. It's a girl. And one that quotes Hamlet yet. You make an interesting dinner, guest. Well, go and make her welcome, Sandy. I've got my hands full here. Okay, Gregory. Good evening. Are you in trouble? Oh, hello. Yes, I, I was glad to see your campfire. I'm praying I'm lost. Well, come and join us, won't you? Uh, my name's Sanderson Taylor. Oh, well, mind you, sir. Sylvia, you... A little unwise for a young lady to be hiking about in the mountains at night, don't you think? Well, I... <laughs> Gregory, this is Miss Sylvia Eustace. Oh, how do you do? Sorry I can't get up, but I must watch this meal. Mmm, do I smell bacon? You do. You'll be our dinner guest, of course. Oh, uh, I can't refuse. I'm starving. <laughs> how would roast potatoes, coffee, bacon, and brook trout a la nature appeal to you? Oh, I, I can't think of anything more perfect. Uh, can I help? Oh, no, thanks. Everything's under control. How come you're up in the mountains alone late at night, Miss Eustace? Well, I've walked up earlier today. I'm staying with friends at Denmark Lodge. Oh. It's about ten miles. I'm afraid I overdid it. What's wrong, Mrs. Uh, here, here, I have some brandy in the flask here. Oh, no, no, thank you. I have a touch of asthma. I'll, I'll take an ephedrine. There. I'll be better in a second. Don't worry about me. I do wish I could do something to help. Oh, it's all right. There. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. And now, how's about the trout? Going into the skillet at this very moment. Ah, listen to it sizzle. Well, I, I don't know if I should eat so soon after an attack, but I'm sure I won't be able to resist it. I'll hope for the best. As Shakespeare says, that good digestion wait on appetite and helps on both.
A wonderful meal. Mm, Gregory, you surpass yourself. I must confess it was mildly colossal. More coffee, Miss Houston? Yes, thank you. Uh, Your face keeps bothering me, Mr. Hood. Hmm, it does have that effect on some people. Yours has the reverse effect on me. Oh, no. No, I mean, I'm certain I've seen it before. Probably in the police gazette. He's always getting mixed up with the underworld. Oh, of course. How stupid of me. You're Gregory Hood, the detective. Well, detecting is a hobby of mine. Well, I, I've seen your photograph in the San Francisco papers. Have <gasps> Oh, dear. I was afraid of this. Hand me my bag, please. Here you are, Miss Eustace. Another <gasps> asthma attack? Yes. I knew I shouldn't have eaten that proud. I'll take another ephedrine. Fascinating objects, those <laughs> tiny red capsules. They really ease up these attacks of yours, do they? Usually. There. If they don't do the trick, I, I can give myself a hypo. Oh! Oh! oh. Help me! Help me! Oh. I never saw a asthma attack as severe as this. Look at her struggle. The way her body keeps crouching. Sandy, this is no asthma attack. This girl's been poisoned. Whatever you may say about the evils of modern civilization, Gregory, at least if we'd been in the city, we could have called a doctor and the police. I know, I know, Sandy. It was ghastly. Don, this wretched car should be in a museum. The old farmer who rented it to us warned us not to expect too much. Uh, in any case, after scrambling down a mountainside in the dark, it's a great improvement. Well, the dawn's breaking now. It would have been better to have waited up there and then carried her body down to the plane and flown it into San Francisco. I can still see that poor girl's face as she died. Yes, it was torture. If only we'd packed some other food, some mustard, egg whites, anything to make an emetic. But to stand there helpless and watch her die. You're sure it was murder? Oh, obviously. Suicides don't seek company. And it was no accident. I know the symptoms of strychnine poisoning when I see them. We must be on the outskirts of some town now. There are a few lights twinkling. Yeah. I wonder where the courthouse is, or even if they have one. If I know these hick towns, it isn't far from the outskirts to the hub of things. Greg, could you make out anything of what that girl was trying to say to you as she died? Almost nothing. The strychnine spasms were racking her, and that, combined with her asthma, made it very hard. Dreadful way to die. I just caught a few scattered words. Sounded like sport, engineer, tar. Does that make any possible sense to you? No, I can't say. Well, Greg, hmm? here we are, the county courthouse. Oh, yes. And the lights are on. Somebody's going to have quite a shock to start their day with. Yes, I imagine murder is something of a rarity in these parts. Yeah. Oh, here's the sheriff's office. Come on, Sandy. Good morning. Uh, oh, you fellas are stirring early. Uh, what's on your mind? Are you the sheriff? Sure. Sheriff Turner. What's on your mind, son? We've come in to report a murder. Sounds as if you said murder, son. That's what I did say. A girl was murdered last night in the mountains. My friend and I saw it happen. You saw it? Jake, come in here. Now, now give me the facts, you two. My friend and I were camping in the mountains last night. A girl named Sylvia Eustace was lost and came to our fire. Sylvia Eustace, huh? Go on. Well, she had dinner with us, and half an hour later, she swallowed what she thought to be an ephedrine tablet and died of strychnine poisoning. Who cooked this dinner? I did. And the girl died right afterwards? Yes. Jake! You something for me, Sheriff? Yeah, get your keys out. You got a couple of customers. Us? Now, look here, I Sheriff. I warn you, Sheriff, that I'm an attorney. Sure, sure, and I'm the Queen of India. Lock him up, Jake. We've got us a couple of murderers. Oh, this is a crazy situation, Sandy. We come in to report a murder and then get booked for committing it. Darn these small towns. The judge is off at the other end of the county, and I can't even apply for a writ. We've got to get out of here. There's only one way that girl could have been poisoned, but we must get to San Francisco to prove it. Sandy, I tell you, we've got to get out of here. Well, there's Jake, the moronic jailer, sitting guard up there. But I don't think we can do much with him. No, no, he looks more in Edgar Bergen's line. Yet, did you notice he was reading detective magazines? He, he may be vulnerable. No harm in trying. Uh, Jake! I'm coming. What's the idea, Greg? Take your cue from me. I'll play it as it goes. What is it, fellas? Uh, my friend and I have been arguing, Jake. Oh. Well, if you call yourself friends, why do you argue? <laughs> <laughs> I can see that you have a terrific sense of humor, Jake. Hasn't he, Sandy? Terrific? That was an extremely funny remark. Oh, <laughs> nothing, fellas. 
does come sort of natural like. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Yeah. You must have your friends in constant stitches. How is that? Uh, oh, forget it, Jake. When I said my friend and I were arguing, what I meant was we were having a discussion about you. You see, Jake, I've always prided myself on my ability to read character. Now, is that a fact? Yeah. You read tea leaves or something? Uh, no, not exactly. But I can tell if a man's smart the moment I look at him. I sized you up as soon as you walked into the sheriff's office. There, I said to my friend, is a really smart guy who's going places. Didn't I say that, Sander? You certainly did. Well, what do you know? Uh, say, you fellas like some breakfast? Uh, settle our argument for us first, Jake, will you? You've got a little more on the ball than we have. I have? Mm -hmm. Well, you're pretty nice guys, too. Um, uh, what'd you argue about me? Well, here's the way it went, Jake. I noticed that you had a big stack of detective magazines over there, and you were reading them very seriously. Oh, read them all the time. Yeah. Read them all the time. Uh -huh. I said to my friend here, there's a really smart deputy sheriff who knows a lot about criminology and wants to go ahead. Am I right, Sandy? Your exact words, Greg. Yeah. Uh -huh. What'd you say next? Well, Jake, I knew you'd heard our story of the murder, and I figured that you were the smart kind of a guy who would say to himself, nobody's going to be such a dope as to walk in and report an undiscovered murder when he's the only suspect. So to do, these guys didn't do it. Yes, Jake, that's the clever kind of man my friend thinks you are. Uh-huh. Uh, what else did you figure? Well, that you're smart enough, after hearing our evidence, to know darn well how the murder had been committed by slipping a red capsule of strychnine in among her red capsules of ephedrine. And then you'd say to yourself, I'll bet that was done in San Francisco, and that's where the case starts. San Francisco, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe you're right, fellow. Ah, you're a clever man, Jake. I'd never have been able to figure that out without your help. Gregory, that's amazing. Jake is certainly quick on the draw. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> just a knack, fellas. Uh, did I figure anything else out? Yes. Yes, I said that you'd follow the thing through logically and see where it might lead. Yes, I said that I'd bet you'd say to yourself, this Gregory Hood is kind of a detective, too, and he knows his way around in San Francisco, and if I let him go, he could solve the case and give me the credit. Give me the credit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then when the election comes around next spring, maybe I'd have a crack at Sheriff Turner's job. Me the sheriff? Yes. Didn't I say that, Sander? Yes, you mm -hmm. did. Word for word. Uh, you guys must sure talk fast. Uh, was that the end of your argument? Uh, nearly, nearly. But you see, my friend here maintains that you're just a dull, obedient deputy who takes his orders and then follows them out. Now, if he's right, you'll keep us here. But if I'm right, you'll let us go before Sheriff Turner gets back to the girl's body. What do you say? Do I say? Hmm. Mister, I don't know how good a detective you are, but you're sure one swell judge of character. <laughs> Gee, Sandy, it's good to be back in San Francisco. Sure. But I hope you realize, Greg, that in the eyes of the law, we're fugitives from justice. Yes, but the law peered at us with very sleepy eyes this morning. <laughs> I'm afraid poor Jake won't be very popular. Well, I had to do it. That oaf of a sheriff would have tried to pin the rap on us. By the time we'd gotten clear, it would have been too late to do any real work at this end. I agree with you there. Just the same, I hope we never have to fly back across the Sierras in a thunderstorm. Yes, it was rather an exciting trip. In any case, it got us here in really fast time. Well, our first port of call is obviously at the dead girl's house. Yeah. Lucky she had those letters in her bag. What was the address again? 116 Marden Street. Ooh, it must be this next house. Mm. She didn't mention her parents. Stanley, I'm afraid this is liable to be a pretty harrowing interview. I don't doubt it. But it's our logical starting point in the search for her killer. Well, here we are. An imposing house. Yes, the Eustace family must be moneyed. Wouldn't be surprised if the news of her death has preceded us. Yes, uh, it's the maid stay out and the butler's quit. We don't want anything, uh, unless you're applying as servant. Is this Miss Sylvia Eustace's home? Yes. But... Uh, may we come in, please? No, you. Well, oh, bless my soul, you're you're Gregory Hood, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. Can't see a thing with my new glasses. Uh, I'm Sylvia's uncle. Come in, won't you? Thank you, Mister Eustace. Uh, this is my friend Sanderson Taylor. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, now, uh, uh, you want to see Sylvia? You mean she's here? Yes, I think so. I'll go and see. Won't be a moment. Greg, what in thunder is he talking about? The girl's dead. We know it. Either Mr. Eustace is definitely eccentric or he doesn't know his niece has left town. Yes, Sylvia's just coming down the stairs. She... She's doing what? Well, don't look so startled, Hood, me boy. Here she is. Mr. Gregory Hood, how very nice to see you. Sandy, it's the same girl we left in Yosemite County.
You'll hear the rest of Gregory Hood's story in just a second. Well, Greg, this is beginning to sound like a ghost story. You and Sandy see a girl die. You get thrown into the clink for a murder. You escape and then get back to San Francisco and walk into the girl you're supposed to have murdered. Doesn't make sense to me. Well, it didn't to us either, but of course the answer was obvious. The dead girl, whoever she was, had an exact double. It didn't take us long to find out who that double was. You seem very thoughtful at seeing me, gentlemen. Frankly, I'm staggered. So am I. Miss Eustace, do you have a twin sister? No, but you must have met my cousin, Hester. People are always astonished by our likeness. Oh, see who it is, Uncle, will you please? Richard Bell, as soon as the servants go, it never stops me. Well, you still look puzzled, gentlemen. We are, Miss Eustace. You did say that your name was Sylvia, didn't you? Yes, I did. Why? Well, uh, did you know that you, uh, I mean, your cousin Hester had gone to the Sierras? Yes. She left three days ago. She's very fond of hiking, just as I am. Another thing. May I ask if you're both victims of allergies? As a matter of fact, we are. You're being very mysterious. Has anything... You're very, very popular today, Sylvia. Here's a, a Lieutenant Silvers of Homicides. Most anxious to talk to you. Afternoon, Miss Eustace. How do you do, Lieutenant? Uh, do you oh, know... yes, I know them, thanks. Hello, Greg, Hello. Mr. Taylor. Didn't expect to find you here. I heard that you'd been uh, detained in Yosemite County. Uh, yes, Stan, we were. But only for a short while, fortunately. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute, Mr. Taylor. Right now, there's more vital talk. Uh, Miss Eustace, do I understand that you are Miss Sylvia Eustace? <laughs> That's the second time I've been asked that question. Yes, Lieutenant, I'm Sylvia Eustace. Why? Well, because I've just received a notification from Yosemite County that the sheriff up there has found the dead body of Sylvia Eustace at this address. He'd been murdered. Well, what in the name of thunder are you saying? Yes. I don't... Oh. Uh, she's made it. I I've got it. Leave her alone. You fellas have done enough damage here. Well, I'll take her to her room. Well, Greg, you are in trouble, aren't you? I certainly am, Stan. You've had a report from Sheriff Turner, I suppose, Lieutenant? Yes, Mr. Taylor. They tell me the two of you broke jail and that you're wanted for murder. Well, we broke jail, all right, Stan, but you can't believe the murder charge. Well, no, of course not. I've known you both too long and too well for that. But, uh, officially, it's my duty to send you back there to jail, you know. But if we're wanted on a murder charge, whom are we supposed to have murdered? Sylvia Eustace. Oh. And who is the lady who just fainted? Sylvia... Oh, I get it. Exactly, Stan. This is a pretty complex case. Before you go shipping us back to death row in Yosemite, I think we'd better have a nice long talk. So there you are, Stan. That's the deal. Two girls, both identical in appearance and both claiming to be Sylvia Eustace. But why, Greg? It doesn't make sense. I think it might, Lieutenant, when you consider that the Eustace family is obviously wealthy. Being the heiress might even be worth murder and impersonation. Correct, Sandy. I'm pretty certain that's the motive at the back of this mess. Well, then you think this girl is a cousin posing as the dead girl Sylvia. Well, that's the way it looks to me. Hmm. Greg, here she comes back now. Gentlemen, I think I can talk to you now. May I introduce my fiancé, Dr. Dickens? Uh, how, do how do you do? How do you do? I'll have to warn you that Miss Eustace is in no condition to undergo any prolonged questioning. Well, we'll make it as short as we can, Dr. Dakin, but you must realize that you're involved in the murder case. How... How was poor Hester killed, Lieutenant? He was poisoned by strychnine contained in what appeared to be an ephedrine capsule. Oh, dreadful. Uh, Stan, do you mind if I ask a few questions? Okay, Greg. You've got to play it in your way. But if it doesn't work, it's back to Yosemite, remember. We know that, Lieutenant. Uh... Miss Eustace, are you in the habit of taking ephedrine? Fairly frequently, yes. What about it? Surely any person who suffers from allergies, as Miss Eustace does, would use the drug. Uh, doctor, doctor, there's no need to get so heated. Miss Eustace, are you fond of Shakespeare? Not particularly. Certainly not the way poor Hester... I fail to see what the devil Shakespeare has to do with it. You'll find out in due course, Dr. Dagan. Uh, tell me, Miss Eustace, to what substances are you allergic I absolutely refuse to tolerate any more of this badgering. Oh, you call this badgering? Well, Doctor, perhaps as her physician, you'd care to speak for her. Well, uh, I'm, I'm just a general practitioner. Dr. Sangerford is Miss Eustace. I'll have just... Oh, I see. Well, Miss Eustace, I'll make you an offer. I'll drop all questioning for the moment on one condition, that you let me come here tonight and cook dinner for you. What rubbish are you talking now, Hood? Uh, what do you say, Miss Eustace? In any case, your uncle commented on the servant problem, and I'm really quite a cook. Well... Nothing you're saying seems to make any sense, Mr. Hood. 
or else I must still be dizzy. But, very well, you may cook dinner here tonight. What menu are you planning? Brook trout and bacon, Miss Eustace. It should give us the answer to murder. Uh, slice up the bacon, Sandy, will you? Right you are, Greg. Uh, Greg, we've been friends for a good many years. If we hadn't, I wouldn't take the risk of stringing along with you on this case. Will you tell me what goes? Oh, now, don't look so harassed, oh. Sam. We're on the last lap. Our question is, which is the real Sylvia? Now, the old uncle might be fooled. He's half blind. And young Dr. Dakin might be in cahoots. True. So we seem to have established only two positive differences between the girl. The cousin, Hester, loved to quote Shakespeare. So did the girl in the mountain. Now, according to Dr. Sangerford, Cousin Hester was allergic to trout, but somehow he'd never checked Sylvia. Oh, now I begin to see why you're cooking a dinner of brook trout. Yes, Stan, if she eats the trout and nothing happens, she's in the clear. Well, I hope you're right, Greg. <clears throat> Maybe I'm a fool for even letting you try it. I've got a nasty feeling that this whole business is one occasion when you've outsmarted yourself. <laughs> At last, you're due to be hoist with your own... Pe- Oh, Gregory, a skillet full of bacon grease all over the floor. The blazes with it. I've outdone myself in idiocy. Quick, Stan. We've got to warn Miss Eustace. Get some warm water water at once and Uh, some mustard. What's wrong, Dr. Dakin? It's Sylvia. She's just been poisoned. How are you feeling now, Miss Eustace? Weak, Mr. Taylor. But I'm all right. It was a miracle I was here and able to apply the remedy in time. She'd been poisoned with strychnine. But this makes it worse than ever. Who'd want to poison them both? Well, Stan, I can give you the answer now. Dr. Dakin, may I ask your fiancée a few more questions? As few as possible, please, sir. Very well. Miss Eustace, you took some ephedrine for a while ago, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. And tell me, in the past few days, did you have occasion to give your cousin Hester any of your ephedrine? Now that you mention it, yes, I did. Ah, just before she left for Yosemite. We were at a party. I'd forgotten to bring my capsules. I had an attack and went to Hester's bag and took several out. Later, when we were home, I refilled Hester's box for mine. But you didn't tell her about this. No, I, I didn't think about it. There's the answer. Poisoned ephedrine had been placed in your box, the one you left at home. Later, quite unwittingly, you refilled your cousin's box from your own, which contained the poison capsules. Then Hester's poisoning was a mistake. The whole thing was really aimed at this young lady, only the plot backfired. I see it now, but why did she pretend to impersonate Miss Sylvia Eustace? That was all part of the plot. Mm -hmm. Sylvia's cousin Hester planned to kill this young lady, then return with a perfect alibi for the murder, having deliberately been in Yosemite at the time and claimed to be Miss Sylvia Eustace, saying that her cousin had been impersonating her in her absence. But, Mr. Hood, I still find this hard to believe. Oh, it's logical, Miss Eustace. It's a plausible pattern. What made you see it so suddenly, Gregory? Stan gave me the clue. You remember the girl's dying word, Stanley? Yes, uh, sport, engineer, tar, weren't they? Mm Mm-hmm. But I didn't spot it until Stan started to rib me just now when he said I was due to be hoist with my own petard. I remembered that Hester loved to quote Shakespeare and that that speech came from Hamlet. For it is the sport to have the engineer... Hoist with his own petard. That's the Shakespearean version of the biter bit. She was hoist with her own petard and knew it. Mr. Hood, you're every bit as wonderful as I heard you were. I can't thank you enough. Well, you're very kind, Miss Eustace. Personally, I think I bungled the job badly. Not a bit. Come on, Sylvia. I think you should rest for a while. All right. And perhaps after that, you'll keep your promise, Mr. Hood, and cook that meal. It's a date. <laughs> I'd like to find out if I do have an allergy to brook trout. Are you right? Yeah, goodbye. Well, Greg, this is all very well, but I'm afraid tomorrow we'll have some loose ends to tie off. You mean a little talk with Sheriff Turner? I certainly do. He's hopping mad. Well, Sandy's my attorney. He'll take care of it. That'll be a pleasure, but uh, I'm worried about his deputy, the gullible Jake. I'm afraid he'll be in very bad repute. Yes, yes, Sandy, he might even be out of a job. I hope your conscience will bother you if he is. It probably will, and I'll find him a job in Hood and Company, Importers. I'd hate to destroy his faith in human nature. Well, Greg, as usual, that story was a honey. 
You know, come to think of it, uh, I'm not so bad at quoting Shakespeare myself. Why, Harry, I didn't know you were a student of the immortal bard. Hmm. You should just see me do a balcony scene. And personally, I'd rather sit in the orchestra myself. Oh, now, cut it out, Greg. Look, let's run through Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. I'll be Romeo. If you think I'll play Juliet to your Romeo, you're crazy. Besides, I know you too well. Well, Greg, what story from your casebook are you going to tell us next week? Next week, Harry, I'm going to tell you an adventure that I call The Forgetful Murderer. It concerns itself with one of the strangest theories of murders that I've ever encountered. I'll tell you all about it next Monday, Harry. The Casebook of Gregory Hood is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Original music composed and played by Dean Fosler. Gail Gordon plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by William Baker. The Casebook of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.